Hi everyone. I'm Indrani Rawat, Administrative Coordinator of Asher India Chapter. On behalf of Asher India and Asher Rajasthan Chapter, take the privilege to host this webinar and happy to welcome you all. I also thank Osama Khayata, RAL System Administrator, for organizing the session. First of all, I request everyone to ask technical questions by clicking on question button or panel button from your headset. The speaker will be answering at the end of the session. Today, our speaker, Mr. Krishnan Vishwanathan, and I have been with Ashish since 1989. In the year 2006 to 2007, he was the president of Western India chapter. Since then, he is actively working for ASHRAE. He has also served on a presidential ad hoc committee to draw up the bylaws and manuals for the region at large. He is also involved with ISHRAE since 1986. Today, he will be sharing his expertise on the topic of current trends in room year distribution. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Now, over to Krishnan, sir. Thank you, Indrani. Thank you very much uh, for that very brief introduction. I uh, appreciate that very much. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Osama for helping us uh, put all this together. Uh, Osama is our coordinator from Region at Large, and uh, I welcome all of you this uh, Saturday afternoon for uh, a small session on the current trends in uh, room air distribution. Uh, what I'd like to do before we actually go is to have a couple of slides which we normally, as a matter of practice, uh, present at all ASHRAE meetings, and that's the ASHRAE Code of Ethics. Uh, I'll just read the ASHRAE Code of Ethics. Uh, in this and all other ASHRAE meetings, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which exemplify our core values of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, volunteerism and diversity and shall avoid all real or perceived conflict of interest. Before we get down to the topic uh, uh, as is customary at all uh, ASHRAE DL and uh, the regional uh, lecture programs, uh, we do a, a little presentation on, the, on what ASHRAE uh, is all about and the ASHRAE CTTC. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what our real objective is to teach, to network, to share, to learn. And by doing all of that, uh, we grow. So participation in actuary activities is an excellent way to advance your career, both technically and personally, and from a business perspective. If you're involved in the HP and the ACNR field or a closely related field, actually is really the go-to organization for professional advancement. Help ASHRAE share the industry, advance research, and disseminate critical information. It's possible to really use ASHRAE as an information resource and not contribute to the development of that information. That's possible, but not nearly as fulfilling. ASHRAE really thrives on the volunteerism work which thousands of professionals like you bring into the society. Don't really treat ASRA as a spectator sport. Participate. Opportunities are all around you. Uh, explore the ASRA website. You will realize uh, what are the various opportunities that are uh, available to you. You may not realize it, but you might be the expert in some area that could be valuable and provide additional value to ASHRAE and its membership. So uh, program ideas, research ideas, handbooks, standards, student mentoring, all these are areas in which I'm sure that in some way, each of you would be able to participate and grow. Uh, with that, uh, let's turn to today's presentation. And today's presentation is uh, we're going to spend uh, the next hour and a half uh, to, to look at the room air distribution. And we're going to look at it primarily from the point of view of uh, comfort. We're not going to focus so much on industrial applications or uh, specific applications 
uh, which might pertain to specific needs. But to the large majority of people uh, who are in the business of air conditioning, uh, comfort is something that's paramount and maintenance of comfort is what really drives the whole air conditioning industry to keep people and processes going. Now, these are the comfort limits which are set by Ashley. Now, this uh, little chart that I'm showing you is something that dates back to 1992. Uh, the Ashley Standard 55, when it was written in 1992, uh, really specced in these numbers. So we talked about uh, what are the kind of uh, numbers that uh, we ought to have in the occupied zone. So we had uh, looked at, uh, or, or in fact, these are the numbers which come down even today. Most of us still work with these numbers and they become like paradigms. So the temperature in the occupied zone, uh, 73 to 77 degree Fahrenheit, uh, RH anywhere between 25 to 60 percent. Generally, everybody works with about uh, 55 plus minus 5 percent. And uh, we recommend that uh, in the occupied zone, we have uh, air velocity of about 50 feet per minute if you are cooling and uh, not more than about 30 feet per minute if you're heating. Uh, the, the comfort standard which Scott prescribed then also permitted us to have a, a temperature gradient of about five to six degree Fahrenheit from the floor level up to the top of the occupied zone. So these are uh, numbers which you can uh, keep at the back of your mind. Most of you will be familiar with all these numbers because uh, this is probably what you work with uh, day in and day out. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the current standard uh, that Ashe is looking at, that's uh, the, the, the last edition, it gives you a bigger leeway to play with. Uh, so it actually tells you uh, in this uh, diagram that you see, uh, you could actually work at much higher temperatures instead of uh, the numbers that we looked at earlier. Uh, we could go to higher temperatures and provided we are able to have some kind of control on the air speed in the occupied zone, uh, which corresponds to a higher air speed at an elevated temperature. Now, why do we uh, sort of uh, move away from the earlier paradigm? Primarily because of the fact that uh, we're trying to maintain comfort at the same time trying to look at uh, what is the kind of saving that might accrue to us from the energy standpoint if you are able to operate at higher air speeds and higher air temperatures. So the current standards don't really prescribe any minimum air movement in the occupied zone long as the, the temperature in the occupied zone is uh, acceptable to the people. So uh, today, of course, increasingly people are uh, talking about trying to maintain temperatures depending upon where you are, and we talk in terms of adaptive uh, comfort, etc. The whole focus really is on maximizing uh, the energy conservation. So you try to maintain a temperature uh, which is uh, acceptable to the people in the occupied zone. At the same time, try to see uh, what is the lowest possible airspeed that you need to uh, have in that occupied zone so that people feel comfortable. Now, the air motion in the occupied zone really is a function of uh, the discharge velocity. So when I say discharge velocity, what I really mean is the velocity of the air at the outlet of the uh, supply air, uh, the supply air outlet. Uh, as the air is leaving the supply air outlet, what is the actual velocity that you measure uh, perpendicular to the, uh, the direction in which the air is flowing out? Uh, so discharge velocity is uh, determining uh, what is the kind of velocity you will have in the occupied zone. Uh, the discharge air temperature also plays a part because uh, uh, all of you are familiar with the laws of buoyancy. So if the temperature of the supply air or the peak primary air is uh, uh, lower uh, as it would normally be when you're air conditioning. Uh, being denser, it would tend to uh, come down. So the larger the differential temperature between the room air uh, and the primary air, uh, the faster it's going to come down. Similarly, if your supply air temperature is uh, uh, higher, the primary air temperature is higher than the room, uh, typically when you're trying to heat, then the air would tend to rise up. So this Thermal buoyancy also plays a part in what will be the velocity 
of the air in the occupied zone. Coupled with these two things, uh, the other thing that would uh, play a part is uh, what is the kind of uh, air diffusion device that you're using uh, to supply and deliver the air into the occupied space. Uh, uh, this would really depend upon whether you are uh, trying to supply the air from the ceiling. Uh, in other words, if you're using a ceiling-based air distribution system, or are you going to supply it from the side wall? Uh, or, uh, which is typically in, in case we are looking at systems uh, which are most common, that's the mixing air systems. But you might have other systems as well, uh, typically displacement ventilation or underfloor, uh, where you would be supplying uh, from the, the floor or from the side walls. So uh, these are the three parameters which really determine uh, how the air would actually be moving within the occupied zone. Now, the relationship between room air movement and occupant comfort. Now, this can best be uh, illustrated if, if we take a step back and uh, think about the days when, you, when air conditioning was not so uh, commonly used. Uh, maybe many of us grew up uh, without having access to air conditioning at homes. So uh, if you went out on a hot summer day and you got back home, uh, you, you obviously felt very hot. The first thing that you did really was to switch on the ceiling fan. And why did we do that? Uh, we did that simply because uh, we, we felt cooler when the fan came on. So did it? does it really mean that... Uh, uh, by switching on the fan, we are lowering the temperature. No, we are not. All that we are doing is uh, increasing the flow of air uh, over our body. And by doing that, uh, the, the increased airflow is able to remove the heat away from our body. It's able to carry it away. So the, the feeling of coolness is created by increasing the flow of air over our body. In other words, we are increasing the airflow over the body. We are increasing the air velocity. So the fan is effectively increasing the local air velocity. So the faster you put the fan on, the faster you, you tend to feel a lot better faster. So that's the feeling of coolness that you get uh, by just increasing the air velocity. Uh, and uh, there have been empirical studies done, and it's generally established that a change in velocity of about 15 feet per minute in air velocity that produces approximately the same effect on comfort as a change in temperature of one degree Fahrenheit. So uh, to put this in perspective, if, if uh, uh, we have uh, a room with a fan on, if I'm able, able to increase the speed of that air over my body uh, by uh, approximately 15 feet per minute, then it feels as if I have actually uh, reduced the temperature by one degree Fahrenheit. Actually, you're not reducing the temperature, but you get that feeling. So it's a perception. So this is actually the relationship between the velocity of air and the feeling of temperature. So room air velocities uh, are generally recommended as, for example, uh, uh, ASHRAE, if you, if you look at the ASHRAE uh, fundamentals and the ASHRAE applications, it will recommend that you maintain a velocity of about uh, 50 feet per minute in the occupied zone uh, when, when you are cooling and uh, not more than uh, 30 feet per minute if you are in the heating uh, situation. Now, uh, like I said, in today's context, we are not really uh, sticking to these uh, numbers. All that we are saying is that uh, uh, try to have uh, a velocity of air uh, so that people feel comfortable. You shouldn't be feeling, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it shouldn't appear as if you are walking into a stratified zone where there's absolutely no air movement uh, so even though the temperature might be uh, low, uh, because of the fact that there is no air movement, uh, you tend to feel very uncomfortable. But the fact remains that uh, any velocity lower than about, uh, in, in, a, in a cooling situation, any velocity lower than about uh, 30 to 20 uh, feet per minute is generally not perceptible. So uh, you want to make sure that you're operating anywhere between 40 to 50 feet per minute uh, provided, of course, that the temperature is not more than 75 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you were to actually uh, think of uh, a situation where you want to raise the supplier temperature and uh, maintain maybe around 78 to 79 or even 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you could well do that and then have this uh, air velocity in the occupied zone go up to about 80 to 100 feet per minute. So 
uh, that's something that you can do very comfortably. Now, uh, there is a method for us to actually calculate uh, what is the uh, effective draft temperature. And uh, that is given by uh, this uh, simple equation, uh, which is uh, which you see in front of you. Uh, so I've got the, uh, the the one that you see in green is uh, for uh, IP units, the British units, and the one below that is for uh, your uh, SI units. So uh, effective draft temperature. Uh, you, what you need to do is to measure the local air temperature at a particular point, which is designated as Tx, and uh, the control temperature is the temperature that you're trying to maintain in the space. So typically, if you're saying that you're maintaining 75 degree Fahrenheit, then control temperature would be read off as 75 degree Fahrenheit. And Vx is the velocity of the air, uh, either in feet per minute or meters per second, depending upon which units you're working with. Uh, so you need to really measure the velocity at the same point where you're measuring the temperature. Now that's a key. So once you, uh, have all these uh, numbers, but like you already know what's your control temperature. So all you need to do is to measure the, the local air temperature and measure the air velocity. Uh, so you need to measure it at the same point uh, simultaneously. Uh, and once you have that, you can plug it in and you'll get a result for the effective draft temperature. And uh, studies have shown again that a high percentage of people, uh, particularly in sedentary situations, are uh, very comfortable when the effective draft temperature lies between minus three and plus two degree Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, now, this, uh, when I'm saying minus three and plus two, uh, this obviously refers to the, the first equation that you saw there. That's for your uh, British units. And if, in case you are working with SI units, uh, then your uh, uh, the, it, it will lie between uh, minus 1.7 to uh, plus 1.1. Now, this uh, pertains to uh, cooling, both these uh, uh, data that I provided you with, that's minus 3 to plus 2 and uh, minus 1.7 to plus 1.1 uh, degrees Celsius would uh, be corresponding to a cooling situation. Now, if you're in a heating situation, then uh, the, the formula changes slightly. Uh, uh, if you need that formula, you can go back to uh, the, the latest edition of the ASHRAE Application Manual 2019 refer to chapter 58 and you will get that formula and uh, the, the same uh, parameters will apply uh, that in case the uh, in the case of a heating situation and you're working in British unit then if the answer lies between minus 4 and plus 3.6 and in heating between minus 2.2 to 2 degrees Celsius then people are generally comfortable okay so this is really what we use to to figure out how effective an air distribution system really is. So that brings us to the concept of air diffusion performance index. So what we actually do is let's assume that uh, we, we all of us are sitting in, in, in one classroom and we have, let's say about 30 people in that class. Uh, so what we will do is once the system is in operation, uh, we would actually take the measurements of our uh, uh, you know, the local air temperature and the velocity around each person. Maybe we'll take a couple of readings around each of those persons and get an average number for your uh, effective draft temperature, uh, uh, an average number for your local temperature and the air velocity, and we evaluate what will be the effective draft temperature around each of those persons. As they are seated, where they are seated. Your air conditioning system is already in place, and we know that uh, the control temperature so we calculate what is the effective draft temperature for uh, at each of those locations and after we do that for all the 30 locations we will get what the answer is and if we find that in 80 percent or 90 percent of the cases the answer lies between the stipulated numbers uh, that we talked about that's minus three and plus two or uh, between minus 1.7 to 1 uh, to 1.1 degrees celsius then people are assumed to be comfortable. Now, why do I use the word assume here? I'm using the word assume because the existing ADPI uh, formulas uh, don't factor in clothing levels. Okay, that's the only reason. So it's expected that everybody would dress appropriate to the situation they are in. So if we find that 
70 to 80 percent of the people are uh, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the results lie between those two numbers then we say that the adpi of that particular system is 70 percent or 80 percent wherever that lies okay now typically this can also be assigned to the kind of uh, uh, S, uh, terminal that you're using so if uh, in that particular situation if, if you find that uh, the adpi arrived at is about 80 percent uh, then we say that uh, the terminals which are used there are able to provide you an adpi of about 80 percent whatever is calculated so typically for uh, uh, mixing air systems uh, or for any other devices uh, uh, these kind of data gets collated by manufacturers and you will find that there are certain types of outlets which inherently produce a much higher adpi than other uh, outlets the reason for that is uh, some of these outlets as we go forward we'll have a look at a few of these outlets uh, have uh, a method by which they are able to provide you a better control in which the air will move into the occupied zone and get distributed so let's try and see what they are so this is what uh, we, we talked about that uh, So that's what I mentioned. The ADPI is really uh, taking into consideration just two factors. One is it measures the temperature and measures the velocity. It doesn't uh, look at uh, what the driver temperature is or what the radiant temperature is or what the relative humidity is or how people are clothed. Uh, so it just uh, tries to correlate uh, the, the, the effectiveness of a velocity with respect to a, a temperature and then tries to convert that into a factor to, to provide uh, a method by which we could evaluate how the system is performing. So let's look at uh, the various types of uh, systems that are available to us to distribute air within the occupied space. Uh, we've got uh, four types of systems which are normally used. Uh, mixing air systems, uh, which is what uh, we use most of the time. In fact, uh, most of the air conditioning system that uh, you are working with in our part of the world would uh, generally be a uh, mixing air system. Uh, you also have displacement systems, you have unidirectional airflow systems, and you have underfloor air distribution systems. So these are the four types of uh, systems that uh, we will be looking at today. Uh, briefly give you an introduction to what they are all about. When we're talking about underfloor air distribution system, this should not be confused with uh, uh, situations where we are trying to supply air to uh, a, a server farm or a data center where uh, we tend to supply the air from below the floor. Uh, the, that's not the kind of system that we're looking at. So let's uh, get into it one by one and try to figure out what these various types of systems are and how they differ from each other and how you could try to see what works best for you. So in the mixing air system, uh, we have three fundamental characteristics. One is that the conditioned air is discharged from air outlets, which are far away from the occupied zone. So when I say occupied zone, uh, what, what do we mean? Uh, the occupied zone is a space which is uh, about, okay, let me just. So if, if that's my floor and that's my ceiling, uh, my occupied zone would be something like this. So I'm looking at uh, a space, uh, that's my outside wall. So I'm looking at a space which is uh, about six feet from the floor level and which is within two feet from exposed walls. So I've got that little uh, cuboid within uh, uh, the, the space that's being air conditioned which is where people are sitting, working, playing, eating, whatever they're doing. So that's the occupied space in a sense. And therefore, uh, anything that we talk about uh, uh, with respect to the conditions that we are trying to achieve uh, will be all within this occupied zone. Uh, and uh, in case these walls are not exposed walls, but they are partition walls, uh, then we can expand this uh, occupied zone to within one foot of the wall so generally we would be measuring uh, from six inches from the floor level to 
six feet to the top of the uh, occupied zone. And why we why do we normally uh, disregard that six inches is because uh, we are generally assuming that we will not be walking bare feet. Uh, the, remember the the back of the neck and the ankle regions are parts of your body which are very very sensitive. And usually uh, we tend to car, cover our feet quite well, and therefore we uh, disregard the conditions at that level. Uh, but you could typically say six feet from the floor level to within uh, uh, two foot from the uh, exposed walls or one feet from the uh, partition wall. So that's really your occupied zone. So, in the mixing air system, we, we, we are saying that the supply air is, is uh, or the conditioned air is admitted into the space from an outlet uh, which is located far away from the occupied zone. So, typically in, 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 in the figure that I just showed you, uh, we would have the supply air being uh, admitted into the space either from the ceiling or somewhere close to the ceiling, which is far removed from the occupied zone. We do not supply the air directly to the occupied zone. Uh, the other criteria that we have in mind is that in a mixing air system, the temperature of the supply air or the primary air is considerably lower than the room air. In other words, if we are trying to maintain a temperature of about 75 degree Fahrenheit in the occupied space, then my primary air or the supply air, the temperature at which it is leaving the outlet uh, would be around 18 to 20 degree Fahrenheit lower. Now this you will normally get when you do your load estimation. Uh, you, you will find that you will evaluate something called uh, an apparatus dew point. Uh, and based on that, you will arrive at what your supply air temperature would be. That's really how you also arrive at what is the actual amount of air that you need to supply into the space uh, so that you are able to remove the amount of heat that is actually present in there. So if you, if you uh, are going to have to maintain around 75, generally you will find uh, depending if the, if the load distribution is not uh, is uniform, uh, you will find that if you supply the air at a temperature of around 55 degree Fahrenheit, uh, you will be able to meet your inside conditions. Of course, you could supply it at a higher temperature, in which case the amount of air that you will need to pump in will be much more. So you will need to do that balance. The third thing that you have to keep in mind is in a mixing air system, you are going to supply the air at a velocity uh, from the outlet, which is considerably higher than what you actually want to maintain in the occupied zone. So like we said earlier, in the occupied zone, we are trying to maintain around 50 feet per minute or thereabouts, and we're trying to maintain 75 degree Fahrenheit. Then at the outlet, my temperature is around 55 degree Fahrenheit, which is much lower than my control temperature. And my velocity at the outlet will be of the order of about 800 to 1000 feet per minute, which is very high. But the reason why we actually do that is that the supplier, as it leaves the outlet, will entrain the room air. And this happens simply because that air is traveling at a velocity, and that velo the jet velocity will create an area of low pressure around the jet, and that will induce the room air to actually mix with it. So what really happens is that your uh, jet is leaving like that from your outlet and because of the velocity of the jet being higher than the actual room air it will create an area of low pressure at the periphery of the jet and that will induce the room air to mix with it so that's how the jet actually expands uh, because there will be an entrain entrainment ratio and that entrainment ratio will ensure that the room air mixes now this is encouraged more or you will have more entrainment if the velocity of the air is higher. The higher the velocity, the lower would be the pressure and therefore the higher would be the entrainment. Uh, also, if the delta T is higher, you will have more entrainment. So these two things will decide how well the system gets mixed. Mm -hmm. that, that's the whole objective. Our idea is to ensure that uh, we get the air mixed thoroughly. That's why we call it a mixing air system. Uh, remember one thing we said that 
uh, the, the outlets are going to be located far away from the occupied zone. So all that we want to do is to make sure that that mixing happens thoroughly and it happens outside the occupied zone so that the occupied zone is not subjected to the kind of turbulences and uh, or uh, any low temperature. So when that mixing happens outside the occupied zone, all that we want to make sure when we select is that by the time the air enters the occupied zone, it has decayed in its velocity. And how does that decay happen? Simply because it's mixing with the room air and also the temperature of the primary air has risen up. It has risen up because again, it's mixing with the room air. So by the time the air enters the occupied zone, we would have uh, a temperature which is your control temperature and the velocities would have decayed to about 50 to 60 feet per minute. So therefore, our decision of locating air outlets, where do we locate them? What kind of an outlet we should select would all depend uh, to make sure that we are able to maintain the comfort condition within the occupied zone. So depending upon what your mounting heights would be, uh, how your duct system is, uh, we will need to select an outlet to ensure that we get proper mixing so that the air which is decaying and coming back into the occupied zone has attained a temperature which is comfortable for you and the velocities are within acceptable limits. Now remember one thing that in a mixing air system, the entire volume of air is getting mixed. Okay, so whatever pollutants are there in the room are also going to get mixed thoroughly. Of course, you are going to filter the air uh, before it's uh, going through the cooling coil and, and things like that. But the fact remains that whatever pollutants are there, whatever the pollutant people are breathing in the room, are uh, whatever you breathe out, are all going to get mixed. Okay, so that's something that you need to keep in mind. So this is what we talked about. Now let's look at some of the different types of outlets that uh, you will come across when you are working with mixing air system. All of you would be uh, familiar with uh, these kind of outlets. You've either seen them or used them. Uh, so whenever you use uh, see outlets like this, you pretty much uh, know that you're working with uh, mixing air systems. So you've got uh, a set of outlets here, uh, which uh, uh, have got some louvers. Now these louvers are all adjustable. So you've got a set of louvers here, which are horizontal. And here you've got uh, a set of louvers which are vertical. Now, here in this uh, outlet, uh, what you've really done is to marry these two together. So you've got a set of louvers which are horizontal and you've got a set of louvers which are vertical at the rear. Uh, you could have them the other way around. You could have the vertical in front and the horizontal at the rear. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the thing to note here is that each of these louvers are kind of adjustable. So you can actually increase the spread of the air uh, whichever way. In, in this particular case, you can increase the spread vertically. Here, you can increase the spread horizontally. Uh, so, what really do you achieve when you are trying to change the spread? Uh, in other words, you are actually playing with the air jet. So, by being able to control the spread, uh, you are able to uh, sort of control the distance to which you can actually throw the air. Okay. Uh, so, you could actually uh, shorten the throw or increase the throw uh, simply because uh, you have the ability to be able to uh, control the spread. And uh, since each of these veins are individually adjustable, or you want to make sure that they are individually adjustable, uh, you can actually uh, increase the spread from zero to about 60 degrees on either side. So that gives you a great amount of uh, leeway to be able to control how you are distributing the air within the space. So if you have a, a device like this, a terminal like that, uh, then you can actually control the spread in both the horizontal and the vertical direction. So uh, really an outlet like this uh, it gives you a very high ADPI uh, because even once you put them up there, uh, you, you can still, uh, even if, if there are some shortcomings in terms of our design, uh, we could with the help of uh, the, the ability to adjust uh, the, the amount of spread, uh, we could actually be able to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that the air is distributed uniformly and that the velocity in the occupied zone is within uh, your required limits. Then you have uh, uh, terminals which have got fixed veins or fixed louvers. Uh, there's nothing much you can do here in terms of, uh, you know, being able to adjust any spread. Uh, so you got to live with what you get. So when you use terminals like this, obviously you need to be very, very careful uh, in, in selecting uh, 
uh, the, the outlet sizes, the velocities, so that you get the right amount of throw and uh, proper distribution. So obviously the ADPI here wouldn't be uh, very good unless you, you select the thing properly. Then you got uh, something called an egg crate device, which is primarily used for return. Uh, then you got some transfer louvers where you want to transfer air from one, one space to another. Uh, then you got uh, some ceiling based devices. These are all ceiling devices. Uh, this is a typical four way uh, ceiling uh, outlet, uh, what we call as a diffuser. Uh, it, it actually gives you four uh, envelopes and uh, uh, those four air envelopes work on the principle of the Kuanda effect. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, as the air jet uh, comes out of the uh, diffuser, uh, the four envelopes, uh, they will encounter the ceiling surface. And because they encounter a ceiling surface, uh, you have a situation where you cannot have any entrainment happening on the top where it is in touch with the ceiling. Uh, whereas entrainment will happen at the bottom of the jet uh, because it's, it's exposed to the room air. And because of that, uh, the velocity at the top uh, near the ceiling uh, remains higher than what's at the bottom of the jet. And this uh, creates an area of low pressure on the top. So it tends to push the jet up towards a, a ceiling and keeps it uh, hugging the ceiling. And thereby it's able to travel a little longer distance. Uh, of course, eventually the uh, friction factor of the ceiling will uh, overcome the uh, pressure and therefore the, the, the jet would then leave the ceiling. Uh, but what really happens in that case, in, in the case of this diffuser, is that because of the fact that the air leaves the outlet and sticks to the ceiling, spreads out and then comes down, it induces a lot of air movement from the space to the bottom of the jet. And that's really how uh, the mixing happens in this case. And uh, so by the time the air actually descends down into the occupied zone, uh, it, it has uh, lost its velocity and the temperature has equalized to the room temperature. So uh, again, uh, provides a very high ADPI, uh, close to around 35 to 80 uh, percent. The, the only pr problem here is that it's got uh, four distinct air envelopes because the air comes out in four different directions. Uh, you could actually improve that by using a, a round diffuser where the air is going to diffuse in a 360 degree pattern and therefore the, the ADPI tends to be uh, even better. Uh, this uh, is, is again uh, a plug diffuser, it's a single phase uh, uh, plug plate on the outside of the, on the inner core. Uh, sometimes you can actually vary the geometry here, the discharge geometry and therefore you are able to actually control the outlet velocity. So uh, the problem with a diffuser like this and this is that if the air uh, volume drops from your initial design, uh, typically it could happen uh, in case you're working with uh, variable air volume units. So at the turn down situation, when your uh, uh, air volume drops, then the outlet velocity will drop because the geometry on the discharge is remaining the same. Now when that happens, uh, that velocity is not uh, adequate enough to generate the Kuanda effect so then it will lead to what they call as dumping of air. Uh, so in such a situation, uh, the, the cold air would tend to come down like a shower. Uh, so if you're standing below the diffuser, you will experience that cold draft. Uh, that's not very comfortable. So obviously, if you're uh, using variable air volume system, then uh, this is perhaps not the right kind of outlet for you. Uh, then we have, again, ceiling-based products here. Uh, these are called swirl diffusers. Uh, basically, what we have is a number of uh, slots which are radially uh, cut and behind that you have some kind of a pattern controlling device. So the air actually comes out in a radial fashion and then it swirls around. And by swirling around, it, it is able to mix with the room air. So even if you're, uh, uh, you're supplying the air from the top, uh, it does not dump the air down. It, it, mix, it swirls the air thoroughly above the occupied zone mixes it completely, and then by the time the air uh, loses the velocity, it comes down into the occupied zone, uh, the, the velocity is low and the temperature is equalized. Uh, you have some additional devices here, which we call strip line diffuser. This is the same as this. Uh, so if you see the profile here, uh, this profile is similar to the uh, to your square diffuser uh, profile. Uh, you know, So, so therefore, uh, it again uh, encourages the formation of a Kuanda effect and therefore does not dump the air down. So if you want to throw from the ceiling uh, uh, and uh, not have a side outlet, but uh, and don't want to use a square diffuser or a round diffuser 
would want to use something like this, you could do this uh, because it again works on the principle of a quanta. Uh, you could have this one way or two way. Then you see this is the two way, uh, this is the one way. And then you have uh, slot diffusers. Uh, again, these are uh, linear slots. And behind the slot, you have uh, some kind of a pattern controlling device uh, which can uh, direct the air to go in one direction or the other, or it could come straight down. So when I'm able to deflect the air towards the sides, uh, I could actually uh, again generate a quanta and therefore ensure that the air doesn't come uh, straight cascading down. I could use this if I want like an air curtain. Uh, the advantage again here is that I can have multiple slots. So I can ad adjust each slot individually. So maybe if I've got three slots, I could have one slot uh, coming down and the other slot going to the side like that. So typically if you've got uh, an exposed wall with a lot of uh, glazing on one side and you want to prevent the radiant heat from coming in, uh, then you could maybe have the slot nearest to the glass uh, to come straight down and the others to deflect the air on the side so that uh, you can take the coanda and ensure that people are getting cooled without a draft. The only thing that you want to uh, take care is uh, uh, to ensure that the air that's coming out of that slot is not angled straight at the glass because if that happens uh, then it can uh, you know lead to uh, moisture accumulation on the outside and therefore uh, not look very good. Uh, then you've got uh, some devices which are uh, used for throwing air large quantities of air over long distances typically uh, you will see them in large public areas like maybe airports or malls uh, large atrium spaces. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, these two devices, if you look at them closely, they are both the same. Uh, so the, the core here can actually swivel around. Uh, so in this position, uh, you, if you can see the profile, they are all sort of parallel. So this actually makes the air go a long distance. It's like a straight jet, just like this. This is a straight jet. So this is what we call as a jet nozzle. Uh, some people call it like an eyeball diffuser or whatever. Basically, it can throw the air over a long distance. This can swivel up and down by about 30 degrees uh, in 360 degree fashion. So you can direct the jet in a particular direction. They can handle large volumes of air and uh, they're pretty silent. Uh, only thing is if you are cooling, uh, then you want to make sure that you don't uh, put them up on the top, on the ceiling. Don't dump the air from the top because uh, being cold, the air is just going to come down like a ton of bricks. So if somebody's sitting down, they're going to feel very uncomfortable. Uh, you would want to throw it from the top, uh, typically if you are trying to heat, not otherwise. Uh, unless you're trying to use it for a return air. But that's a very expensive uh, return uh, terminal. Uh, in this case, uh, this core swivels around. So in this particular setting, it, it can give you a long throw. And when I swivel it around, then it becomes like this. So here what happens is that, that means this, uh, the, what you're seeing here is the rear side of uh, the, this uh, core. So here it becomes like a, a diffuser and uh, uh, so it kind of increases the spread. So basically what it does by increasing the spread is you're shortening the throw. So this is what they would call as a, a jet diffuser. Again, you use it uh, in areas where uh, the uh, amount of air quantity that you require is quite large and you want to throw it over long distances. So that's a typical uh, installation of uh, jet nozzles. Uh, this is another typical installation that you see nowadays is the use of uh, a fan in addition to your air being supplied from the terminals here. Uh, now this is a typical uh, swirl diffuser uh, that's being used and then we've got these uh, fans, what are called as HVLS fans. Now, this serves two purposes. One is uh, it is make, making sure that the velocity uh, in the, the, the whatever mixing happens, the air is pushed down into the occupied zone. Now, this, this could uh, do two things. One is uh, we are trying to use the same uh, system for supplying hot air as well as uh, supplying cold air. In other words, heating and cooling uh, from the same system. So uh, when we're trying to heat and supply from here, at that point in time, uh, the, that warm air will stratify and need not reach the occupied zone. So at that time, uh, a fan like this will help us to ensure that we uh, push the air right down into the occupied zone. So uh, increasingly, you will see this uh, happening in many places. Sometimes this is also put as an afterthought because uh, the original system was not able to uh, maintain comfort.
comfort conditions whatever for whatever reasons uh, so this is uh, added as an additional device to to make sure that uh, people feel air movement particularly in crowded areas increasingly i am seeing this in several airports uh, uh, around the country uh, where uh, otherwise in the hot summer months you might feel uncomfortable especially when it's uh, you know when the flights are getting delayed and people are hanging around uh, at the departure concourse then uh, uh, so th this fan comes in pretty handy. So the, the, we call them the SVLS fans and they are able to make sure that there is adequate air movement in the occupied zone so that people feel comfortable. Uh, this is uh, an actually publication which is uh, the designer's guide for selecting outlets. Uh, those of you who are keen to know more about it, uh, I would recommend that you uh, get access to this publication and you will have a better insight into how you would select ceiling based outlets and how you would lay them out, etc. Uh, when we're talking about mixing air systems, uh, conventionally we are talking about uh, units uh, which are supplying a constant volume of air and uh, that air is admitted into the space, it mixes and that's how we achieve the cooling. Now, uh, in the old days, uh, th this is really how we worked, but increasingly because of the fact that uh, people are getting more energy conscious and you want to have uh, better energy efficiency uh, we find that and generally when we did that kind of uh, design uh, we would really be looking at the hottest part of the uh, year when we are doing our load estimations so you would pick the hottest day of the year uh, do your load estimation and arrive at uh, what's the airflow that is required to be to keep people comfortable but as you know that uh, in all air conditioning systems uh, generally uh, are probably uh, not even for a single day in the year the system might be operating at capacity. Most of the times it's working at part load. And this is true not just of your know, chillers, uh, but it's also true on the air side. Uh, so if you actually do a load estimation for the, the entire year for 8760 hours, uh, you will find that there is a particular point uh, where you require uh, a CFM of let's say for a particular room maybe 1000 CFM. And uh, there are certain parts of the year where you require maybe uh, only uh, 300 CFM. So it doesn't make sense for us to have uh, a system which is going to keep dumping 1000 CFM a pair regardless of what the actual need is. So if you want to save energy, uh, then you must figure out a way by which you can actually supply only that much air that is required. And why do we have to focus on this? Because uh, at the end of the day, what is supplying the air to that space? It's a fan. So if you are able to look at what are the uh, advantages by supplying just the right amount of air, then we need to look at what the uh, the fan laws are. Now, if you are familiar with fan laws, it's basically there are three fan affinity laws. The first uh, law is very simple. In that It says that the amount of air that the fan will put out is going to be directly proportional to the speed. The second thing is that the uh, static pressure generated uh, by the, uh, the the CFM is proportion the, the the static pressure is proportional to the square of the air. Uh, so the first thing we said is that your uh, speed is proportional uh, to the airflow, and the last thing is that the power varies as the Q of the speed. Okay. So if I take a simple example and I say that uh, let's say I have a uh, fan which is delivering me let's say 8000 CFM of air and uh, for that fan to work and deliver 8000 I'm just taking some arbitrary number uh, so if I have a fan which is running and uh, delivering 8000 CFM of air and let's say it's consuming 8 kilowatts uh, and I require instead of 8000 maybe a part of the year uh, I require only 4000 CFM so uh, how does it uh, really uh, help me if I actually make the fan do that uh, maybe I could just let it run and let the people feel cold or whatever. Uh, that's one side of the story. Or I could tell the people that look, dress yourself appropriately because that's what I'm going to deliver, whether you like it or not. Or I look at the other way. If I require 4,000 CFM instead of 8,000 CFM, then the actual power I require to, to deliver 4,000 is not 4 kilowatts, but actually what I require is about 1 kilowatt because my power requirement is going to vary as a cube. So, uh, it makes a lot of uh, sense if I am able to reduce the speed of the fan uh, because 
If I reduce the speed, I'm going to reduce the power consumption, and my flow is directly proportional to the speed. And therefore, if I reduce the speed and deliver just the right amount of air, I have ample opportunities to try and save money where I can. And that led us to the use of terminal units. And terminal units are typically uh, classified as constant volume units or variable air volume units. And uh, they further get uh, classified as uh, pressure dependent or pressure independent. And uh, they actually regulate the amount of air that flows into the space. And you could do that uh, using different types of uh, controls. You could use analog control, you could use a digital control or a pneumatic control. And what you really need is uh, two things. We need to know what is the temperature that you want to maintain. And you also need to know uh, what is the amount of air that is required uh, in that space to maintain the comfort condition. So these are the two parameters that you will need to know when you're trying to work with uh, terminal units. So let's try and see what these uh, terminal units are. A typical uh, uh, terminal unit, simple in design, which, uh, uh, which is a pressure dependent device, is what we call as a bypass terminal. So what does a bypass terminal do? Uh, you have, uh, so that's what it typically looks like. Uh, this would be your inlet and uh, that's your outlet. So the air will enter from here and go out from there. So typically it's just a device through which air passes. Uh, you have a little controller here, which is nothing but an actuator. This could be a modulating actuator. And that works on the basis of a input from a modulating thermostat, a typical wish stone spray. Okay, so uh, in case uh, in the room, we find that we had a normal requirement was 1000 CFM and uh, uh, to maintain uh, conditions in that space. And uh, so when we supply 20,000 CFM, it will maintain a temperature of around 25 degree Celsius. And uh, uh, we, we, we say that at a temperature of 23 degree Celsius, we don't want any air to be supplied, but at 25, uh, we need to supply 1000 CFM. So when the uh, room is trying to maintain 25, then uh, if that's your set point, we'll have 1000 CFM going in and 1000 CFM coming out and going into the space. But if we go and turn that thermostat down and say that, look, I need to maintain 24 instead of 25, then really speaking, what it means, uh, what, what the controller understands is that, hey, look, I, I was supplying uh, 1000 CFM and at 23, I don't have to supply anything, but now the guy wants 24. So all I need to do is to supply 500 CFM. So uh, what it does is this, this uh, actuator here uh, will move a damper blade that will allow 500 CFM to bypass from the top. So it bypasses from the top and goes back into the return air. So in other words, it takes a position which is 50% free area. So from a fully open position to a fully closed position, it goes 50% of the way uh, and then assumes that 50% of the air is going through. Uh, it's, it doesn't really mean at this point in time that it's going 500 CFM is going through. Okay. Now imagine a situation where I've got an air handling unit and I've got a long duct, and I've got cabin A, where I have a unit like this, and I've got a cabin B, which is 20 feet away. Uh, both are identical cabins, both require the same amount of airflow, uh, that's 1000 CFM each, and in both those cabins, I've got uh, units identical to this, uh, identical to each other. So in the first cabin, when I set, take the temperature down to 24, uh, the damper will assume a position which is 50% open, and we are assuming that 500 CFM is going to go through. Similarly, in the cabin, which is downstream, uh, again, the same thing is going to happen, right? The damper is going to assume a position which is 50% open, uh, and we will have, uh, we are supposing that 500 CFM is, to go, is going to go in. But if you actually go to site and take a measurement, you will find that in the first uh, room, instead of 500, maybe you're getting about 570, 580, or 600. And in the cabin, which is downstream, you're probably getting about 400 or 450. So why is this difference? The difference is primarily because the input static pressure at the inlet of the VAV in the first cabin is different from the in input static pressure at the VAV inlet uh, on the cabin, which is downstream. The reason for that is the static pressure that's available in the duct is going on reducing uh, as you start from the air handling unit. So therefore, this airflow will vary. And therefore, the person 
even though he thinks that if I put it at 24, I will get 500, doesn't really get 500. Okay, so that's because this unit is pressure dependent. So the closer it is to the fan, the more air it will provide for the same damper position setting. Okay, uh, so, so this becomes a pressure dependent device. Now the only way to overcome this, uh, this uh, fallacy about assuming that a damper position gives a fixed amount of air is to be able to actually measure the air that's going through. So we, we have a pressure independent unit now, this is what a pressure independent unit would look like. Again, you have uh, an inlet and you have an outlet which is going into the room. Uh, so here what happens is that we will have a method by which we can actually measure. Uh, we do measure the temperature in the room. because That's going to be your method by which a person sitting in the room is going to be able to set the demand. We also add a method by which we can measure the air flow. So how does that work? So this is a, a device with a short casing, and then you got a device with a long casing so that you are able to provide some kind of attenuation in case you want. So typically, this is what your pressure independent uh, unit is. Uh, so this is your unit. You got a damper, and you got your actuator. Then you'll have a controller. Okay. And this controller gets input from a set point value, which is your room thermostat or a room temperature or a room unit, room temperature unit. And there is a differential pressure transducer. So what it does, we've got, uh, if, you, if you look at it closely here, you've got two sets of tubes, okay? There's one set of tube, uh, both these have got little holes on them. So this has got holes facing the front and this has got holes facing the rear. Uh, so basically what it is doing it is measuring uh, the, the one in the front which is designated as plus is measuring the total pressure and the one at the rear is measuring the static pressure the difference between the total pressure and the static pressure will give you the velocity pressure and that velocity pressure is then used to calculate velocity because there is a, 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 a equation which says that the velocity pressure is equal to uh, the velocity upon 4000 pi the whole squared where velocity is measured in feet per minute and the velocity pressure is in inches of water column. So you have a direct relationship between the velocity pressure and the actual velocity. And knowing the velocity, having calculated the velocity and knowing the cross-sectional area, uh, we can act, have an algorithm which can actually directly convert that to the flow rate. So now we have a, a setup where we know what is the flow rate and we also know what is the temperature. So we could actually program the controller to say that uh, if you want to maintain 25, I need 1000 CFM. If you want to maintain 24, I need 500 CFM, etc. So once that is calibrated, uh, this is constantly measuring what is the temperature and what is the flow rate. And based on that input, it gives a command to the actuator to modulate the damper. So this is what uh, a pressure independent BAV actually works. Uh, you could have uh, additional features uh, put in, uh, like you can make it a constant volume unit by having a fan. Uh, so uh, you you have fan powered terminals, fan powered could be series fan powered, could be parallel fan powered, uh, depending upon how you really want to use it. For those who want to uh, have uh, more detailed uh, inputs into uh, how you would uh, select air terminals, what these are in more details, uh, uh, and how would you design a system which uh, requires air terminals, which are VAV units, uh, please uh, refer to the actual design guide. Uh, this is a, one of our newer publications. It's, it's uh, out for the last uh, two and a half years now. So uh, this gives you complete uh, details about selection, applications, controls, how do you commission them, etc. So this is a great publication handover. Those who are uh, working with air terminals or need no more information, uh, please refer to this guy. So that brings us to the next system, which is what we call as a displacement a ventilation system. Uh, this is not something which is very new. Uh, this has been around for very long and uh, primarily it, it's really started in Europe and uh, utilized primarily in industrial facilities, but now it's become uh, quite popular even for uh, occupied spaces. Uh, so how does it really work compared to a overhead mixing system? Uh, so in the overhead mixing system, we had uh, air being supplied from the top 
uh, that is far away from the occupied zone at a low temperature, say around 55 degree Fahrenheit, and everything was mixing well. And then people in the occupied zone were uh, kept comfortable. So we had uniform temperature in the occupied zone. Uh, now, uh, what happens in the case of a, a displacement system? In a displacement system, just uh, the, the, remember the three characteristics that we talked about in mixing air. We said that the primary air will be supplied far away from the occupied zone. Uh, in the case of a, a displacement, the, the primary air is going to be supplied directly into the occupied zone. So that means uh, we, we don't have uh, units installed overhead uh, or on the side wall far away. They are going to be installed within the occupied zone itself. Okay. Now, uh, remember what we said earlier, that in the mixing air, we've got outlets far away, but they're supplying air at a temperature which is much lower than the room temperature. So we were supplying at 55 when the room was around 75. Now here, since we are going to supply the air directly into the occupied zone uh, space, uh, which means the outlets are going to be located within the occupied space, uh, we need to make sure that the temperature of air is higher. So the temperature of air is usually anywhere between 68 to 70 degree Fahrenheit if you are trying to maintain 75 degree Fahrenheit. And the last thing is that earlier we had a very high outlet velocity. We had that high outlet velocity so that the air could mix properly before it enters the occupied space. Here, since the air is coming directly into the occupied space, our outlet velocity is going to be very, very low. Okay. So what we expect it to do is to come into the space and stratify itself. And I'll just run a small little video for you so that you get an idea of how this really works. So this is a space here. And then we've got a person who is, this is our thermal load. The cold air is actually entering the space. And because it's, it's colder than the room air, it settles to the floor level and it moves forward because of the pressure at which it is being delivered. And as it moves forward and encounters a thermal load, it creates what's called as a thermal flow. So you can see that this is rising up along the load. So this thermal plume will take the load, move up and go up to the top and stratify there. So you can pick up the return from the top and that's how the, the air movement is generated. So long as there is, there is a heat source, you will create this thermal plume and the air would automatically rise up along that and go up. So here is another view of that. Here again, you'll find that the air descends into the space and moves out and that's your thermal load. So you can see it cascading along the floor. It encounters this uh, load and gets heated up because that's a thermal load. And then it's picking up this and it's going up. You can see that very clearly. So you would have your return somewhere on the top. Uh, this is located within the occupied zone. Uh, there you can see a very nice thermal plume being generated. Uh, this is really how displacement works. Again, you got the uh, same way. And here you got your thermal load. So this will have a heater inside just, just to generate a load. And we can create this kind of uh, thermal flow. And this uh, kind of outlets, you know, they, they just spread the air around and the air will uh, make, go around the whole space. Uh, even if there is a, an obstruction here, it will, it will not stop. It will go around the obstruction. So typically you might have a space and you might have a table or a chair or whatever. Uh, it will tend to go around and spread and remain there stratified till it encounters a, a, a thermal load. So that's important. So you can see that it's, it's actually uh, moving out. It, it goes around the obstruction. Okay, so you need to place these uh, the displacement diffusers strategically so that uh, it, it, it can actually reach out to the thermal load. So you can uh, see here that the person is standing here and the amount of air that's required gets it's picking up the load, rises up, and as the uh, cool air is rising up, more cool air comes to go up. So the return is at the top. Uh, so the biggest uh, advantage here that you can uh, visualize is that uh, uh, it's got a tremendous amount of uh, uh, flexibility in terms of where do you want to put your outlets depending upon your seating plan. And 
the biggest advantage, as I said, is if you, if you look at your uh, uh, the the fact that you're supplying primary air from down, and then at, as it encounters the human being, which are your heat sources, it starts to rise up. So the person who is uh, breathing the air in, uh, even in the occupied zone, is getting uh, cool primary air treated, filtered, uh, unlike the mixing air system where everything is getting mixed up, you know. So therefore, what happens is that the actual ventilation efficiency in this case is much better than uh, what you have in the case of a mixing air system. Uh, the the uh, let's look at the other advantage. Okay, before we look at uh, the the advantages, uh, these are some of the applications they are used practically uh, in all kinds of applications. Uh, so that is the uh, part where I'm talking about the ventilation efficiency. Uh, so in a mixing, what I'm doing, I'm mixing the entire volume of air. Here, what, what happens is that the cold primary air comes from down and then it's going up because of stratification, right? Warm air is rising up. So the concentration of pollutants in the return air to the concentration in the breathing zone, uh, we find that the uh, in the case of a displacement or an underflow, the ventilation efficiency is about 20% more which means you can actually uh, use that much less outside air uh, if your local codes will allow you to do that. Uh, so, so when you tend to use less outside air, uh, obviously you're going to save a lot of energy because you don't have to condition uh, the air, the outside air, which might be at a much higher enthalpy. Uh, so the lesser the air you condition, uh, the, the, the savings in energy uh, is to your advantage. So what we're doing is supplying Temperature of the air is at about 65 to 70 degree Fahrenheit. The velocity is 40 feet per minute. And uh, so therefore, since your supplier velocity is lower, uh, you can actually make do with a, a, a smaller fan speed. So smaller fan speed uh, would mean that uh, your uh, power consumption will be that much lower. The other thing that you want to uh, remember is that since I'm supplying my uh, air at a temperature which is around 65, unlike the mixing, where I was supplying the air at 55. So if I'm supplying the air at 55, my chill water temperature would have to be uh, lower than that. So we're typically looking at chill water in the region of about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so my chiller efficiency in the case of uh, a displacement ventilation, where my temperature of air is 65, so maybe my chill water temperature would be of the order of about 55. So my chiller efficiency is improved. Okay, so that's one source of uh, energy efficiency for me. But remember one thing that even though my uh, outlet temperature has increased and my efficiency has uh, uh, improved, my tonnage doesn't change. Okay, and why is that? Because the delta T of the air is now going to go up substantially. Unlike the earlier case, my delta T of the air is going to go up substantially. And therefore, my tonnage remains the same, though I am up. But the uh, savings that I am getting primarily is because of the fact that I am operating uh, the chiller at a uh, higher uh, suction temperature. So for the same discharge, uh, my chiller operating compressor operating head is reduced, and therefore I save power. So uh, these are some of the benefits. Uh, not much difference in the way we designed the duct system. Uh, it's pretty similar to the way we design our conventional. Uh, duct system. Only thing is because uh, we, we are uh, going to supply the air at a low velocity, we want to make sure that the uh, velocity of the air as it's entering the uh, displacement diffuser uh, or displacement outlet is lower. Uh, so that's the only thing that we take care of. Uh, again, there's a wonderful publication which uh, ASHRAE has, uh, which is uh, on displacement ventilation design guide. Uh, those of you who want to uh, look at this uh, a little more in detail, uh, I would encourage you to look at this publication. This gives you a method by which we can actually calculate supplier volumes, supplier temperatures, and uh, how we would select your outlets and so on. Uh, the reason why this is slightly different from the mixing air is because uh, we are supplying air directly to the uh, occupied zone. So for us to calculate what is the actual dehumidified uh, airflow required, uh, I need not factor in the amount of heat ingress from the space above the uh, occupied zone. 
so that much of heat ingress actually goes into the return air so that's the return air gain uh, including the lighting load etc so my dehumidified cfm which is my total uh, uh, you know sensible load in the occupied zone divided by 1.08 by delta t uh, is actually defining my airflow so then you find that the airflow required is much much lower uh, so therefore my fan size gets lowered my ducting sizes get lowered so that's a big saving so there that gives you a uh, so all this that you see which is above the occupied zone all that heat actually is getting into the return air which is your light load and uh, all the fabric load which is above the occupied zone uh, all gets into the return air these are some of the uh, various outlets that uh, we use uh, that's available to you for displacement they could be uh, all placed on the floor or below the floor as well they all directly into the occupied space from typical installations uh, there you have air coming out from below the seats uh, or from that surface there and that's uh, at an airport these are your displacement outlets they could also be placed within the floor uh, I'm showing this as underfloor air conditioning, which is pretty much the same as displacement, uh, except that in the case of uh, displacement, uh, it is completely stratified. There is no mixing of air that takes place. Whereas in underflow, there is a small amount of mixing that happens where the air is actually uh, exiting the underflow diffuser, and then thereafter it works on a principle of stratification. So that's your. Uh, and now we can have a look at what the underflow air distribution is. Uh, obviously, it's, it's something very similar to the uh, displacement that you saw, except that instead of supplying the air from the sides uh, into the occupied space, we are supplying it into the occupied space from below the floor. So we actually need to create a, a raised floor. Uh, and the conditioned air is then directly delivered into the occupied zone. Uh, you could have some kind of an outlet which is placed on the floor and return is picked up at the top. So uh, that's what your typical floor would look like uh, you you have uh, these the raised floor uh, these are the uh, elements on which your access floor tiles would be resting uh, typically you would use a, a two by two uh, tile which sits on these pedestals and a lot of your services uh, also tend can then run below the uh, floor uh, all your cabling etc can all run below the floor uh, it, it works very similar to the displacement, as I said, and uh, in the cooling applications, the air movement is very efficient because uh, you have the cool air coming from below the floor, uh, then it gets warmed up because of the thermal loads in the space and it will simply go up. So you don't need additional fan power to uh, push the air up, you know, unlike uh, in the mixing air system. Uh, obviously, you don't want the air to come up in the home of a jet, so you need to have uh, special devices. Uh, this is really how it uh, happens so the air will come out of the jet uh, you don't have a very high velocity jet that comes out it kind of comes out and it's like a, it's a small swirl diffuser it swirls the air and then allows it to spread on the floor and then it will spread to the floor and then it will work pretty much like how your uh, displacement was working uh, the only thing that we want to make sure is uh, uh, we don't place them uh, directly where people are sitting so we need to identify areas where you can have this as i said the air will exit the outlet and spread along the floor and then be able to reach all the occupants uh, major advantage of uh, using this is that uh, since all your services tend to run below uh, you don't have any overhead duct systems so if you want to redesign an office uh, or uh, change the layout it becomes very easy uh, you can uh, uh, the, the tile on which your outlet is uh, put it can be simply taken out and relocated and it gives you the same advantages of uh, having a better ventilation efficiency as high as 20 percent so the saving in energy uh, is uh, uh, really uh, feasible for you and also the fact that if you've got a large uh, the, the normal height that you might tend to have from the floor to the ceiling since in a conventional mixing air system you will tend to have an overhead duct and then you need space to take the return etc uh, you need to have that minimum height between the floor and the soffit of the slab uh, so so in in the case of underflow 
uh, you don't need that much of space. So if it's a large building, uh, when I say large building, I'm talking about a high rise building, uh, then it is possible to actually uh, effect substantial saving so that you can maybe save a floor or two in the entire building. That that is save in terms of your uh, civil construction costs. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, what we talked about, the ventilation efficiency. Uh, this could be methods by which we supply. Either we can uh, have the entire uh, plenum being pressurized, and then you have these outlets, or if, if the uh, space is very large, and you feel that we cannot pump the air uh, from one end and make it uh, ensure that we are able to reach it right to the other end, uh, we could also lay ducts below the floor, uh, and then have them connected to the uh, outlets. Uh, so uh, if, if the for normally I've seen I found that even for spaces like 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 square feet, we really don't need duct work. You can just pressurize the plenum and uh, still get uh, uh, just make sure that the, the the access floor heights are adequate uh, to maintain uh, that kind of uniform pressure. Uh, so you save a lot of money in terms of uh, the ducting. Okay, uh, have to take some special care because uh, remember one thing that. When we are doing uh, our displacement as well as underflow, uh, we talked about temperatures uh, of the air being uh, around 65 to 70 degree Fahrenheit. Now, obviously, this might have a one uh, uh, issue, and that is in areas uh, which have got higher humidity. Uh, so, uh, at that supply temperature, you might not get adequate amount of dehumidification, and therefore, you will need to find method by which you can handle the latent load. So you might have to get in treated pressure to take care of the latent load applications. So this is something which is design specific. You will have to address that issue. Uh, the, the other thing that you will need to look at is uh, since you're going to use the floor, uh, you want to worry about what's below the floor. So if you are situated on a particular floor and there's another area below it, and that area is not air conditioned, then you've got to be a little careful because it can lead to uh, condensation on that level and also the heat ingress that can come uh, because of the mass thermal storage uh, of the structure. So you will have to take care of insulation uh, of the you know, the floors uh, so that uh, you don't have these issues. Okay. Uh, so typically this is uh, how it is laid out so that you don't put any outlets very close to where people are sitting. Uh, so this will ensure that there is no draft or there is no noise. Uh, the other thing that uh, we need to also uh, take care is about uh, the cutouts. Because uh, since it's going to come from below the floor, this is generally the big problem that uh, one encounters when we are doing underfloor uh, uh, air conditioning is all the cutouts that get made for the various services to come up uh, tend to have leakages. So you want to make sure that all these penetrations are well sealed so that people are not, uh, so that there's no leakage. This is something that you got to take care of. So actually, the uh, if you look at, uh, we have a, a wonderful publication again from Ashley, which is the Underfloor uh, Air Design Guide. Uh, this this uh, has, it comes in two volumes. Uh, so there is one which uh, helps you with the design aspect uh, and the installation aspect, and there's one on commissioning and maintenance. Uh, so it, it actually lists out all the areas of concern uh, which you need to address. and. Uh, if, if you actually follow all this very closely, this becomes a very efficient uh, system. So, uh, like I said, those who are interested, uh, please look at the uh, underflow design guide. This is again a publication, it's about two years old, and uh, it's now available on the Ashley Bookstore. Then, of course, we have uh, uh, the other system, which is unidirectional. This is largely uh, confined to industrial applications, manufacturing areas, clean room areas, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what we have here is that the air flows uniformly in one direction, uh, okay, and then flows out uh, either from this side or it can go down and then get out. Uh, something like a laminar flow, and ideally uh, these streamlines would be uninterrupted. And, and, we, and we do this largely not from the point of view of uh, uh, human comfort or personal comfort, but more from the point of view of uh, uh, production processes, uh, or maybe you're working in an operating room, 
uh, where uh, we want to make sure that there is no, no cross flow or cross contamination of air. Uh, so in that case, we want to make sure that the air flows from one side to the other and uh, not the other way around. Uh, typically, for example, in a paint booth, uh, that's another area where we want to have a uniform airflow from one, one direction to the other. Uh, so you could have uh, air flows like this. So you can see that the person is working here and there is a uh, airflow in one direction picked up the bottom and then it gets recirculated or from this side it comes in from here and then gets picked up and goes out of the other side uh that's about uh, unidirectional airflow uh, i also want to tell you a little bit about uh, thermal beams uh, Thermal beams largely work on the concept of, uh, uh, you know, it's something like a radiant cooling uh, kind of situation. But here we uh, have a coil that's a chill water coil, or it could be a hot water coil, depending upon where you locate it and whether you're trying to heat or cool. That's why we call it a thermal beam. I don't want to call it a chill beam, though many people normally refer to it as chill beam. Uh, so if you're cooling, yes, then it's called chill beam. What happens is that there is water circulating within this coil it's a conventional cooling coil and uh, the, since uh, there's cold water circulating in this the air around it uh, gets cooled and because uh, it's cold uh, the air tends to go down and as it tends to go down it creates a kind of a convective current and that's how the airflow will continue to happen so this is what we call as a, a chill beam or a chill ceiling uh, so it's, it's put up there and the natural convective process gets set up and uh, that keeps the air moving from, uh, goes down, comes up again, and that's how the cooling wave works. Uh, obviously, it uh, requires no uh, fan power, uh, but it's got a little limitation in the, in, in the sense that uh, you don't have any great perceptible air movement. So that gets, uh, and also the fact that, uh, uh, remember, you're, you're kind of recirculating the same air, so. Uh, there is no fresh air or anything like that coming in. Uh, so in that sense, that's a bit of a disadvantage. And you tend to work with passive chill beams. Uh, so we have something called an active chill beam, where uh, uh, what you've got is, uh, again, the same coil. And uh, we've got a central primary air duct which comes in above this coil. I'm just showing you a sectional view of a, what a thermal beam or chill beam would look like. And this air is actually... Uh, Dehumidified, it's treated fresh air, if you want to call it that. And that's blown into this void by means of small jet no nozzles. So, uh, as I explained to you earlier, if you have a little nozzle that's blowing air at a velocity, it creates an area of low pressure. So, since the air is coming out at a higher velocity here, it creates a bit of a low pressure area around that jet. And that induces this room air to rise up. So, this room air is obviously warmer. So it tends to rise up. It goes up through the coil. And as it goes up through the coil, it mixes with this cold primary air and comes out. And this is kind of angled up in such a way that you are able to really generate a kuanda. And therefore, the air doesn't dump down and it fixes. So this way, it's able to take care of the uh, latent load. It's bringing in fresh air. And the only uh, problem that uh, we will have is that uh, uh, you know all of you are familiar with what happens when you circulate chill water through a coil uh, it, it sort of uh, it causes humidification so uh, because of that you have condensation and then you want to worry about what you do with that condensate how do you take it out etc in the case of a chill beam which is going to be directly uh, installed within the uh, space uh, above the occupied zone it becomes very cumbersome if you want to drain out uh, these coils so all we ensure is that uh, uh, these coils are uh, always operating above the dew point. Okay, now that's a, a specific control that you want to uh, maintain. So it, it does call for an elaborate uh, control mechanism whereby we ensure that the uh, temperature of water that's admitted to the coil is such that the coil dew point remains uh, above the dew point of the room. So you don't have any condensation taking place. Okay. And the latent load is primarily, so basically then they become the sensible coil. And the latent load in the room is generally taken care of by the 
uh, treated fresh air that is admitted through this uh, duct that's coming from outside. So uh, that's uh, really how it works. And uh, uh, so that's a chill beam which is set up. This is a, a chill beam on the test. And uh, uh, so you can get an idea of how the air flows. Uh, so there you can actually see the air flow. So it, it actually comes, so the return air actually goes up from down here. And uh, that's how your uh, air, which is the, the, the return air is uh, actually mixing with the, the primary air and then it gets discharged back. So you can see that again. So you need to have this uh, ceiling so that the, that quanta effect uh, is uh, happening so the air doesn't mm -hmm. down. Okay, so that's for terminal units and uh, these are some of the references that actually brings me to the end of this uh, uh, small presentation. Uh, these are, uh, apart from the publications that I uh, talked about, uh, uh, I would also like you to look at uh, the, the following uh, chapters. Uh, actually, the, the, the new application handbook, which is the 2019 edition, which is now available online, uh, the, the chapter number is 58. Uh, this was the earlier print edition. Uh, the, the last uh, edition, which was 2015, uh, but uh, the, the latest edition, 2019, uh, you can read uh, chapter 58. Uh, the other uh, chapters are uh, from uh, Stay As They Are, uh, chapter 20, on both fundamentals and equipment. Uh, so but that's the additional reading for uh, uh, those of you who are interested to know more. And uh, that's my contact details. So uh, any of you want to reach out for uh, anything that you want to know more, please feel free to do that. And uh, uh, we can take some, uh, we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes left. So uh, we could take questions at this point. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll actually uh, look at the questions. Uh, and then I'll try to take them. So are, if there are any questions, I can. Okay, so. Uh, can I ask uh, Indrani just put up the questions there, please? Indrani, can you help me with that questions? Indrani, can you hear me? Yeah, is that air velocity is applicable for cooling of machine, etc.? Uh, can I can I have questions here on the screen? Indrani, can you just uh, put them up for me here? So I can just uh, take the questions uh, straight away. Okay. Uh, if I, I can't get her here, so if somebody wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask me the question, then mute it back, and then uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, so if, if you could tell me your name and ask me the question, I'll be happy to address it. Anybody who wants to go first? Okay, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see some questions. Somebody uh, unmuted themselves. Can they just mute themselves? So I'll just take the questions from here. Uh, okay, so the, the first question from uh, Hariswar uh, Reddy, it says uh, you'll be able to share the PowerPoint. Yes, I can. Uh, all you need to do is to get in touch with the, uh, uh, the organizer and they'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, then uh, uh, 
Uh, will you will we have the recorded session? Uh, yes, uh, the, the session will be recorded. Please uh, contact the organizer. Uh, same question again from Michael. Uh, will we have the materials? Yes, of course, uh, it's available for sharing. And uh, if you're not able to get it, uh, you saw my email ID, just reach out to me and I'll be happy to uh, mail it out to you. Uh, so most of the questions that I see here are pertaining to the material. Uh, so there is a, a question here which says, why would you require to calibrate uh, for a pressure independent VAV in terms of CFM versus room temperature? That's from Gautam Baliga. Okay, uh, Gautam, the reason why we actually want to calibrate is that uh, we need to let the controller know uh, what is the uh, minimum flow and the maximum flow? So uh, these are the two parameters we want to let the uh, controller know uh, so that uh, when we do a set point, uh, it, it's able to analyze what's the amount of airflow that it requires uh, for a maximum uh, temperature and a minimum temperature setting. Otherwise, uh, if, if you try to work with just the temperature input, uh, you will. Uh, uh, there's no point in us just measuring the airflow unless they are able to give that information to the controller. So that's the reason we actually have to calibrate uh, to let the controller and, and hard code these uh, details into the controller. That is opening of the damper is correlated to the temperature. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Then uh, which criteria needs to follow to avoid condensation on air devices? Uh, well, uh, if, if you're talking about condensation happening on uh, your terminal devices, that's your uh, diffusers, drills, etc. Uh, first of all, you want to make sure that uh, there is no outside air impinging directly on the terminals because the terminals uh, will be at a temperature which is closer to the room temperature. So if you've got uh, moisture-laden air coming from outside and hitting those terminals, uh, there is a good chance of condensation happening. Uh, and also you want to make sure that the airflow uh, out of that uh, terminal is actually happening over the entire cross section of the terminal. Uh, sometimes, uh, if the uh, connection to the terminal is improper, uh, you will have airflow uh, not happening over the entire, uh, uh, you know, outlet area, and that can sometimes lead to a little bit of uh, condensation happening in the ends. So make sure that your collar connections are uh, proper. So this actually question came from Kasim, and uh, he's unfortunately left. Uh, then Kasim also asked a question, which certification needs to be checked from the manufacturer? Uh, well, uh, it depends on the kind of outlet you're using. Uh, all you want to make sure that uh, uh, all the terminals are rated as per uh, standards. Uh, most terminals get uh, rated as per ASHTA standard 70. If you're looking at uh, uh, VAV terminals, you could uh, look at AHR 880 certification or the ASHTA 130 st uh, standards. Uh, these are some of the standards which are available for testing. Then uh, the question is, where underflow is distributed systems are used by Bhageshri? Uh, well, uh, you could use underflow air distribution uh, for any comfort application. Uh, like I said, all you want to make sure is that uh, you have a method by which you can uh, take care of the humidity requirement. Uh, there's no reason why you can't use it even for a normal comfort application. Uh, when do we use uh, Amir Ibrahim? Uh, when do we use a ceiling swirl diffuser? Uh, well, yeah, any time you want to supply air from the ceiling, uh, that's a ceiling-based air distribution system, you can use a swirl diffuser. You can use it in place of a conventional four-way square diffuser or a round diffuser. Uh, the type of swirl diffuser that I showed you are typically used for ceiling up to a height of about four meters, but you get uh, special variable adjustable swirls even for larger heights. So uh, you can use it for any uh, mixing air system, even for heating. Okay. Uh, Vivek uh, Vani's question is, what will be the delta T value for unidirectional airflow uh, system? Well, uh, uh, Vivek, uh, the, the, I, the, there won't be any specific delta T number here uh, that I would ascribe. Uh, we would use unidirectional airflow only because your requirement calls for it. Uh, it's uh, got nothing to do with Delta T, uh, depending upon if you want a laminar flow or if you want airflow to flow from one direction to the other so that there's no cross contamination, uh, that's the criteria. Then Aditya says, What type of diffusers are recommended in ICU? Uh, HEPA filtration is, if HEPA filtration is not there, well, uh, uh, 
What do you want to ensure in ICUs to make sure that the, uh, the, the air terminal is located? Uh, you could use a four-way diffuser or you could use a grill. Make sure that the, pers the, the, the air draft is not coming directly uh, over where the patient is resting. Uh, and you want to pay, make sure that the supply air and the uh, return air are adequately spaced out so there's no short cycling. Uh, obviously, in a, uh, I see you wouldn't be putting a HEPA at the terminal. So any, any outlet uh, can be used. Make sure that there's no direct draft on the patient. Then we've got uh, what may lead me to use active chill beam system rather than mixing system. Oh, well, uh, first of all, the active chill beam system is going to cost you a lot more in terms of the actual equipment and also in terms of uh, uh, the, the control systems. But uh, what it does provide is uh, for uh, a much quieter system. And uh, the, the fact that, uh, remember one thing that uh, you're basically using water to carry the heat. In case of air, uh, you're uh, supplying air into the space and that air is taking the heat away from the space. Whereas in the case of a chill beam, uh, you are using air for the last mileage, but uh, largely using uh, water to carry away the heat and the thermal conductivity of water is much better and therefore uh, makes sense to use chill beams. A question from Tapan Basu, what is a thermal diffuser. Well, a thermally powered diffuser is uh, a diffuser which has got uh, a device which is able to uh, control a damper at the, uh, uh, at the rear of the diffuser. It generally works on a thermal element and that thermal element has a property that it can, uh, it melts at a particular temperature and uh, it, it uh, becomes solid at a particular temperature. Usually between 70 degree Fahrenheit to 78 degree Fahrenheit is the range. Uh, at which these thermal elements work. Uh, so at 70, it, it is actually solid, and at 78, it becomes a liquid. Uh, so uh, the, the, the expansion and contraction uh, is actually used to move a piston, uh, which can transfer that linear motion into uh, a diffuser, which can open and close. Uh, so that's uh, a thermal diffuser. Uh, what is the recommended air outlet uh, for air showers? Uh, air shower, generally you will have uh, nozzles, which is that you need any device which can actually pump air at high velocities because the idea is to uh, wash the person down. So any kind of uh, nozzle is uh, good. Uh, what is the minimum height? Uh, one second. Uh, what is the minimum height? One second. Uh, Okay, so what is uh, the minimum height? Uh, now, which we need to use jet diffuser? Uh, Aditya Vibhute's question is, what is the minimum height above which we need to use jet diffuser? First of all, Aditya, you should never use a jet diffuser if you're going to throw it from the, uh, from the top, uh, especially if you're cooling. Uh, you want to make sure that the jet diffuser is installed uh, on the side walls. Uh, and you want to make sure that it is installed above the occupied zone and it's not blowing the jet directly into the occupied zone. Uh, that's all that you need to take care uh, because these jet diffusers can be adjusted so that the, the throw is, the idea is to get a long throw. So, so you want to do an angle it directly into the occupied zone. So that's uh, what you want to take care of. Then uh, uh, what is the thermal diffuser? We answered that. We answered, uh, okay, the next question is from Princely Samuel. It says, uh, what's the impact of blow in air diffusion? How do we manage design for that? I am not really able to understand this uh, question, uh, Sam Princely. Uh, you say, what is the impact of blow in air diffusion? Uh, how do we manage design for that? So I, I presume what you mean by blow is the throw. Uh, so uh, really speaking, you need to uh, know what the throw is. So you look at the catalog and figure out what the throw is to give you a certain uh, the, the desired terminal velocity. Uh, so that's very important for you to know because without this, you can't really select the right kind of diffuser. So that's the impact. Uh, unless, if I'm not making myself clear to you, please feel free to contact me by email and I'll respond to you. Uh, what's the difference between passive beam and chill beam? Uh, okay, so uh, I mentioned that uh, Uh, 
there's a question on uh, uh, air curtains. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to answer that question on air curtains for you, but if you look at uh, the uh, last uh, uh, edition of the ASHRAE uh, handbook on equipments, uh, we have a full chapter. Uh, it, it does cover uh, the the uh, air curtains, so please look at that. Uh, the difference between passive beam and active chill beam, the difference is that in passive beam, you don't have any supply air being brought in from external side. There's no treated air in the active beam. Uh, there is uh, treated air being brought in, and that's how uh, the, the system is working. You saw it uh, in the video. What is control temperature? Control temperature, question by Aditya, is that uh, uh, it, it is a temperature which you're setting the room at. So if, you, if your set point in the room is 75, that's your control temperature. Uh, what is CAV, Tapan Basu? The CAV is constant air volume unit. Uh, sometimes you, uh, what they do is uh, you want to maintain a constant flow of air in the space. Uh, so typically you will use a fan powered terminal. So what you, you generally do is uh, use a, a series fan powered terminal box where the fan is running constantly. Uh, so uh, depending upon the temperature that you want to maintain in the space, uh, it, it shuts the, the primary air damper will shut off and the, uh, the, uh, the balance air is uh, picked up and mixed with the supply air and then supplied into the space. So you maintain a constant flow of air within the occupied space. Uh, question from uh, Abhishek, uh, what is air cross-section velocity in mixing system? Uh, I don't get this question. Uh, what is air cross-section velocity in mixing system, displacement system and children system? Uh, Abhishek, I'm not able to understand this question, uh, so can't answer that. Uh, then there's a question from Santosh Indulkar. It says, uh, what's the difference between a grill diffuser and a register? Uh, well, uh, a grill is, is a device that you would normally put up on a side wall. A diffuser would go on a ceiling, and a register is any outlet with a control damper would be called a register. Uh, Convert Singh says, what instrument would you measure the velocity of air when you're working towards ADPI or while calculating draft velocity? Uh, would a hot wire anemometer be required? Well, Convert, uh, uh, the, the, the hot wire anemometer is expensive, but uh, it's a good instrument to use. Uh, anything that you can uh, measure accurately is what I would advocate that you use. Uh, typically, you could use a hot wire anemometer. People generally tend to use uh, a wind anemometer, uh, but a hot wire anemometer is something that's far more accurate, though more expensive. Uh, Suresh K says, uh, what happens if the ADPA arrived after cooling load calculation will be less than 50 degree Fahrenheit? What will be the minimum requirement of ADP temperature? Uh, well, uh, 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 honestly, Suresh, uh, there's nothing like a minimum requirement. It will all uh, come out from, from your uh, load estimation sheet. Uh, so. Uh, there's nothing like a minimum, I guess. Uh, you you will, uh, depending on your load uh, estimation, depending upon your sensible heat component, component and the latent heat component, you will arrive at what the ADP is. So, next question is, uh, uh, okay, there is, uh, we will need to, what about pressure drops and noise levels across? Okay, one second. There is a, a Subbu says, what are the certifications that we should look for by selecting air terminal, say a diffuser or grill? Um, well, Subbu, uh, the uh, certification as in uh, you, you need to have, make sure that uh, the ratings that you're looking at uh, uh, on a product catalog are uh, based on some kind of uh, a standard. And typical testing standard for air outlets uh, I would recommend is ASHRAE uh, standard 70. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And then Converse says, what about pressure drops, noise levels across terminals? Uh, yes, of course, uh, Converse, you're very right. Your, your uh, catalog, product catalog of the manufacturer should give you pressure drops, should give you noise levels, should give you throws, uh, et cetera, uh, without which uh, selection becomes difficult. Uh, then uh, there is Yash Karkhanes who says, uh, we will need to regulate AHU fan speed in the system with multiple uh, pressure independent VVS connected to a single AHU. How do we ensure air volume is required as per demand? Uh, well, actually, uh, what happens is that you need to have a method by which you will uh, 
control the fan speed. Uh, as the BAVs in the pressure independent system start to close, uh, the pressure inside the duct uh, will start to build up. And you will therefore need to have uh, uh, pressure transducers inside the duct. And then that will be uh, uh, giving an input to the uh, AHU fan to regulate the speed. And that's how it is done. You can have different algorithms by which you do this. Uh, you can have uh, either multiple. Uh, the, the earlier we used to have a practice where uh, you you kind of put it, uh, you know, two thirds of the way uh, down the longest duct. Uh, but uh, the current ASHRAE recommendation is that you go 75% of the way. Uh, but uh, the, there are different methods by which it is done. Uh, you could have a pressure transducer put at the outlet of the AHU and then uh, uh, you know, set the static pressure and keep resetting it so that the uh, the last BAV at the uh, the most critical line is always open to deliver the required air quantity. So then different methods. So uh, then there is somebody who says uh, videos on mixing air systems. Uh, well, I don't have it in this presentation, uh, so can't help you with that. Uh, Majid Amri says he would like to have documents uh, on chill beams. Uh, well, there's the uh, Riva chill beam design guide. Uh, Majid, you want to refer to that? That will give you a lot of information. Uh, uh, there is uh, Rudra Pratap Aditya who says, then how to go ahead? I'm not sure uh, what is it he's talking about. The question is incomplete. Uh, Gaurav Bhatt said the, the video we have seen is just because of difference in temperature of air and obstruction or there should be some effect of viscosity property of air as well. Now, which video are you talking about? Uh, are you talking about uh, a displacement video? Uh, well, uh, uh, in, in the case of a displacement, uh, what, what's really happening is that the, the air is uh, exiting the outlet and uh, uh, because the fact that air is at a temperature which is lower than the room temperature and because of its density, it just kind of settles to the surface and gets pushed forward. And uh, as it encounters uh, a heat source, it gets warmed up and starts to rise. So that's really how it works. Uh, there's no other property that you need to worry about. Uh, Raghumuttu Kumar is left, so I don't take that question. Then there is uh, Ibrahim Mohammed says, thanks to the organizer, please, uh, how do you present dirt centering the air terminal in the case of underfloor uh, duct? Uh, well, okay, uh, uh, Ibrahim, uh, the, all these uh, terminals that you put on the underfloor, these are very special devices. You just can't put a normal uh, a grill or something like that because uh, these, these devices actually come equipped uh, with, with a, a good swirl grid on the top. They are made of uh, die cast aluminum and it's got a dirt trap uh, at the bottom. So you can remove the core and, uh, you know, clean it out on a regular basis. So that's uh, really how those pieces are designed. They actually uh, do come uh, with uh, dirt traps which can be removed and cleaned. Uh, then uh, uh, there is a, a question by uh, Bijoy. He says, uh, one of our projects, the H installed is very old and motors are incompatible with BFD. So that in case, can I use David bypass to facilitate proper airflow. Well, actually, uh, uh, Bijoy, the, the, when you're using a bypass VAV, uh, remember one thing that you are only providing some sort of a control at the at the occupied, uh, occupied zone level. But uh, as far as the system is concerned, it's handling the same volume of air. So there's no energy saving per se uh, uh, that you that's going to accrue to you. So uh, really you need to uh, check whether you want to do all that. Okay. Uh, and like I said, uh, uh, you, you want to also make sure that uh, if you're going to retrofit, then you want to make sure that uh, the AHU is, uh, uh, the fan has got uh, the capability to generate adequate static that is be required at the entry of the VAV boxes wherever they get located. So that's a calculation that you will have to do to check that the fan has uh, adequate capacity to be able to push the air through. Uh, so the Joyce question is repeated. He repeated it again. Uh, Aditya says, how about cleaning of floors uh, in the case of underfloor cooling. Well, uh, uh, Aditya, that's the easiest thing to do. Remove the tiles, use a vacuum cleaner. Remember one thing that this is a big advantage of underfloor. 
Uh, you can't clean what's on top of the false ceiling, right? Uh, that's impossible to do. Uh, but in underflow, that's why it's much cleaner and much better. Uh, so cleaning is very easy, not a problem. Uh, so then the other question was, uh, uh, I am not getting displacement ventilation easy is left anyway, so I don't bother. How to measure pressurization of the space to the ambient? Uh, well, you, you, you use a, a, a gauge, simple. Uh, how to calibrate minimum airflow for the VAV in order to maintain proper pressurization within the space? Uh, uh, how do we calibrate this? Uh, in the sense, see, these, these are calculated numbers. The, when you do your heat load estimation for the entire year, uh, that's when you'll arrive at what your maximum flow is and what the minimum flow is. So there is a certain time of the year. For example, you might be having an office which is working 24 hours, uh, 365 days. Uh, so in, in in the winter in the night uh, you will require uh, say 500 cfm per particular space uh, but in summer for the same space at in in in, uh, in the afternoon uh, you will find that you require 1200 cfm so that's really how you uh, determine uh, what's the minimum and maximum and once those numbers are established that you simply use that to calibrate the airflow uh, then uh, the question from uh, Tapkudin Syed is how sound attain VAV boxes to be addressed. Uh, well, uh, any VAV has uh, uh, two types of uh, sound that you need to worry about. One is your uh, generated noise and the other is your discharge noise. Uh, so uh, as far as discharge noise is concerned, what you could do is go, you can go for a, an extended case uh, unit, uh, acoustically line it from inside. Uh, uh, and also you have downstream of the unit, you will have some length of duct uh, and a terminal. So all that also provides attenuation. Uh, for re case regenerated, uh, again, the idea is to use uh, a good quality insulating material within the, within the unit. Uh, that takes care of it adequately. And generally, you will have VAVs and then you'll have a false ceiling, etc. So uh, generally, not much of a problem. Uh, recommended sound level while selecting air term distribution terminal. Well, uh, Sunil Kumar Reddy, the, the recommended sound level will have to come from your uh, customer. What is the NC level that he would like to maintain in the space? And then you will uh, look at your uh, selection uh, catalog for the product and select a product which will meet that NC criteria. Rudra Pratap, uh, sound level DB going to affect selection of diffuser. How to go ahead? Well, uh, Rudra Pratap, my answer is uh, exactly what I uh, mentioned for Sunil Kumar Reddy. You must know what is the application and what is the sound level that you need to maintain. Generally, these are given in NC numbers or what is the sound pressure level required. And the catalog will give you either the NC number or it will give you a sound power level. And based on that, you will have to select uh, the appropriate terminal. Then uh, Raibole is left, so I don't take that question. Uh, okay. Uh, Abhishek Jain has left. Uh, then uh, Ashok Das, uh, could you throw some light on induction factor of air distribution products? Uh, uh, when, when you say Ashok, uh, when you're talking about induction factor, I presume you're talking about entrainment. It's, uh, so entrainment ratio really is actually external to the device. Uh, so, depending upon what is the outlet air volume, out, what, what's your uh, velocity, uh, it's easy for us to calculate what the actual entrainment ratios are because there are simple formulas available for that. Uh, for uh, uh, Pratik uh, says, uh, uh, we do not see any mention of return air terminal position. Why so? Surely it will have an effect. Yes, of course, Pratik, uh, I did specifically talk about return air. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we want to make sure that uh, our return air terminals are again selected based on uh, return air ratings and not based on thumb rules. Uh, we want to make sure that they are located in such a way that we do not have uh, direct uh, air moving from supply towards the return. So uh, we need to look at the, the layout and then position them accordingly. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you select it based on the criteria of what, what, what is the actual amount of air that can be extracted depending upon what is the uh, negative static that's available behind the grid. So please look at the catalog and select. Yes, but I didn't specifically mention it. Uh, Tirunavu Karsu says, kindly tell all to unmute, okay?
Bhageshri's question is, there are suction fans sort of at the outlet to suck air at high velocity. I'm not very clear about this question, so can't take it. Uh, Salman says, uh, is there any relation of NC level with higher outlet velocity? Of uh, Well, Salman, uh, the higher the outlet velocity, the higher is going to be your uh, uh, noise level coming out of the uh, diffuser or the grill. So you, you want to select, when you do the selection, you have to uh, look at all this together. You need to look at uh, the, the, the outlet, the, the outlet velocity will decide what your throw is going to be, right? Uh, so you, you need to look at the outlet velocity, you need to look at what is the NC level, and you will also need to look at what the pressure drop is going to be. Because the higher the outlet velocity, the higher the noise level, the higher the pressure drop. So uh, you want to make sure that you select the optimum uh, uh, situation. So uh, that's the correlation. Uh, uh, Bhageshi says, is that air velocity is applicable for cooling of machines, etc. Well, uh, I'm not very really clear about this question, so I can't answer that. Uh, Rudra Pratav has left. Sudhir Mathur is passive chill beam have a blower. No, no, Sudhir, the uh, passive chill beams are just that. There is, uh, it is, is relying purely on uh, convection. Uh, somebody called Girish's question, he has left, so I don't take it. Majid Ambi says, is it mandatory to use HVLS fans? Uh, where is that question? One second. Is it mandatory to use HVLS fans for large air volumes or uh, what are the typical conditions application where we need to insert this in addition to air distribution terminals? Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, HVLS uh, really uh, stands for high volume, low speed fans. Uh, so it, it's it's not that uh, I, I can't you know tell you that this is a particular application uh, uh, that it can be used or not. Uh, so sometimes, like I said, it, it can be pre-designed that you will have a, a certain amount of uh, air coming out of your uh, supplier outlets at a particular temperature and you can increase the velocity in the occupied zone by going in for uh, HVLS fans. Uh, so we talked about right in the beginning that uh, if we are talking comfort condition, it's not necessary that uh, we have to have a lower temperature and lower velocity. And we could have higher temperature and higher velocity. So uh, use it discreetly. Uh, Salman says, uh, is air quantity required in displacement ventilation? Will be no, no, Salman. Actually, the, the dehumidified air quantity is much less than in conventional mixing system. Uh, I told you that how we do the load estimation. So we are only taking the heat input that's coming into the uh, occupied zone. So therefore the dehumidified uh, CFM will be less because your numerator where you're putting the room sensible heat is going to be lower. Uh, so uh, therefore the, the actual air quantity will be lower. Uh, Mohammed uh, Shanan says that increasing the supply temperature and displacement to 65 uh, will it affect humidity removal? Yes, of course it will. Uh, that's why the caveat that uh, in areas which have got uh, higher humidity, uh, you want to uh, figure out how you're going to do this. Would you have to add reheat? Uh, these are the aspects of design. Uh, obviously, since you're going to supply air at 65, the, the coil by itself uh, uh, will not be able to remove that much moisture. So you might have to add reheat. Uh, so that's why I said look at the design guide and figure out how to do that. Uh, Akbar Zahir, uh, hi Akbar, uh, UFAD, do you have the challenge of having more ducts to handle? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, like I said, uh, most of the cases uh, we are able to make do with just pressurizing the plenum. Uh, but if your floor area is very large, uh, then, then you might have to use uh, ducts, but it's not a problem at all. Uh, it, it's much easier than uh, using conventional overhead mixing systems. Uh, then... Uh, uh, Omar Abro says in displacement, isn't a higher supply volume required since the supply temperature is uh, reduced to maintain the same load? Uh, no, actually, Omar, that's what I said, that uh, your actual load uh, the, uh, is going to be lower uh, because uh, most of the load in the room that's above the occupied zone is going to go into Guritan and heat cane. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, even though the delta T on the uh, dehumidified heat uh, calculation is lower, your room-sensible heat component in the numerator is lower and therefore you will be having a lesser amount of air to deal with. 
so Ashok Patel's question is again answered earlier. Uh, how is the return air routed? Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the decay the underfloor. We what we do is the air uh, comes into the space from the floor and then we, it gets warmed up and rises up. So there is a little bit of mixing taking place at the floor level, and after that we are relying purely on stratification. Uh, the warm air would rise up and we collect return air at the top. Uh, so therefore, there is no additional fan power uh, required to push the air up. Uh, Abiola, if you're supplying air at a high temperature for displacement ventilation, how then do you control humidity? Uh, I already answered that question. Uh, terminal velocity is increased to princely. Uh, terminal velocity increased to 800. Uh, to have better entrainment, what will be the impact on air noise? Yes, that's right. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, Princely, what we need to do is to look at the catalog and uh, make sure that uh, you know we, we uh, select the right uh, outlet size uh, uh, so that uh, we are able to balance uh, both the requirements. Uh, we need to balance the requirement of not both, actually three. Uh, we need to balance the out, uh, requirement of flow. We need to look at uh, what what will be the noise level and also what the pressure drop is. Because uh, as we increase the velocity of the terminal, the outlet velocity, uh, then uh, your pressure drop is going to increase as well. So uh, we got to factor in that also. Uh, if duct is designed at more than 1500 feet per minute, uh, what should be the FPM of the grill? Grill temperature will be 27 if duct is designed at more than. Uh, well, please remember one thing that uh, don't get confused between what is the velocity of the air inside the duct because. Uh, uh, Inside the duct, the velocity is simply divided by the cross-sectional area of the duct. Now, whereas uh, at the terminal, you have to look at what the effective area of the terminal is. Uh, the effective area is a function of uh, not just the uh, cross-sectional area as you see it, but it factors in things like coefficient or discharge, etc. Uh, so therefore, the effective area is much less than what you actually see, and therefore, the outer velocity tends to uh, increase automatically uh, because of uh, coefficient or discharge, etc. So. Uh, uh, that's taken care of. Then uh, Raghumutu has left, Pindu has left. Uh, Kishore Kumar has left. Uh, hi, yes. sir. I'm Anjani here. It's already uh, time is over. So Everyone can ask questions on the link uh, shown or the mail ID Mr. Kishan has uh, shared. Yeah, I think that that would be good because uh, I think we have uh, exhausted our time, have we? Yeah, it's actually 602. So uh, <laughs> I couldn't answer all the questions, but uh, uh, what I will do is I will uh, do two things. One is uh, you uh, all of you have my email ID. So any questions that you've already put in uh, or you have additional questions on any of this presentation, uh, please, please uh, feel free to email me and I will uh, be able to communicate with you. The other thing is I will send a copy of this presentation to the organizer and uh, any of you who wants a copy uh, can please get in touch with the organizer and uh, they'll be happy to send it out to you. So you will have all the uh, slides. Uh, I will send out a copy. Uh, please feel free to use it. That's actually material. So uh, I have no issues in sharing with that. So I want to thank all of you for uh, coming by. Uh, it was wonderful talking to all of you. I hope I was able to uh, give you some insights into the current trends in uh, room and distribution. And uh, uh, happy to talk to all of you. Thank you very much. And also thank you to Indrani and Shailendra and the uh, host chapter for having me on this presentation. Thank you very much. And God I also love. thank everyone. I also thank everyone, the participants, and uh, Shailendra, Osama, Mr. Krishnan, thank you so much for such a nice session. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Uh, today, more than 330 participants have joined. Thank you very much. I'm happy yes. to see the uh, gathering, and uh, hopefully, you will have more successful programs in the future. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you.